I hope you and your family have enjoyed your Easter Sunday, and I hope that as a group of people that y'all are investing in your relationship with God. I hope that you guys are uh, continuing to read his word and continue to pray and talk with him and to learn and to grow. Over the next few weeks, what we're going to be talking about um, in Sunday school as a youth group is we're going to be talking about the idea of confrontation, this idea of the white elephant in the room. And all that simply means is that the white elephant is a term that has been used in the past to describe an idea or a concept that nobody wants to talk about. It has two characteristics. It's something so big that everybody can see it, and it's big obvious in the room. And the second characteristic is it's awkward, so nobody wants to bring it up. All right. Usually this consists of some sort of topic where you're in a room and people feel uncomfortable, so they just kind of stare at each other and don't want to address it. And this can, about, this can bring about some problems and destruction. But before we get into it, what I want you to do is I want you to sit down with your family. I want you to discuss three questions. Question number one. On a scale of one to ten, how comfortable are you with confrontation? Question number two. Where do you imagine the term elephant in the room came from? Question number three. When you were a kid... What is the meanest thing that you ever said to a friend? Go ahead and Oftentimes, a church is filled with elephants. No one wants to talk about depression, pornography, or any kind of sin that they can't seem to get a handle on. At the same time, people are less willing to talk to somebody that has wronged them, that has hurt them, because they don't want to have to deal with it. But when we read the Bible, we see that facing the elephants in the room is a common part of the Christian life. In fact, it's very important. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of those elephants and how to confront them in love and in truth. The first thing we need to address is, how do we even begin to confront the elephant in the room? What do we say when someone's struggling in the church with sin? Do we just ignore it? Or do we let them go on their way? How do we let people uh, who have wronged us, how do we confront them? People who have uh, caused pain and hurt in our lives. What do we say to them? Do we say anything at all? How do we address that? The elephants in the room need to be dealt with because if they don't, they will grow and fester inside of you and it will become a very destructive weapon inside your life that the devil will be able to use. And instead of bearing fruit of the Lord, you will end up bearing envy and destruction among your friends, your personal relationship with God, and many people around you. Now what I want you to do is I want you to open up to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. I will go ahead and give you some time to open up that, and we'll read that together. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 19. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. If your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Matthew 18, 15 through 19. I also want you to open up to another passage of scripture, really, really quick. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Galatians 6, 1 through 5 says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. 
Now, in these two passages, we are given two different guidelines for confronting someone in specific circumstances. The first passage talks, Jesus advises us to do um, what to do whenever somebody wrongs us. Jesus tells us this. Um, we can't just lay it aside because anger starts to build up within us. But what we first need to do is resolve the situation by bringing it up and doing it in private, just one-on-one -on -one with that person. You don't need to call them out and you don't need to embarrass them. But what we do need to do is go with them one-on-one -on -one and talk with them about it. Now, after we have done that and it's still not working, then you bring two or three others and you include them in it. Don't include them in it beforehand. If you do that, that will cause a lot of tension and anger between lots of different people. And it will say you should have come to me first. In all reality, you just created a big hole for yourself instead of letting um, God work through your situations. Now, whenever you bring the two or three friends over there, you still are coming at them and you're still talking to them about um, whatever they did wrong, whether or not they wronged you and hurt you, or whether or not they're falling in sin. Regardless, you have two or three people there with you um, to talk about the situation. If still they do not talk about that and they do not resolve the, the, the confrontation and the person doesn't want to talk about different things, then you go to the church. And if in that moment they don't respond, then you cast them off. This is scripture. I'm reading straight out of scripture what it's talking about here. Now, when we go and look at these things, it's very important to realize that any time we confront somebody with this, especially a fellow believer in Christ, the purpose is not to shame the other person. I've had many opportunities when I was doing ministry in other places that I've lost some people because I approached them in the wrong way. Instead of going them to loving and gently, I brought shame and disgrace upon them and they ended up leaving and I never saw them again. And the relationship that I had with them was broken and I was never able to restore. The fact of the matter is, is that God doesn't do that with you either. If you're starting to do things in your own heart and in your own life and you start to drift away and God chases you down and he wants you to come back, he will bring you back gently and kindly. He's not going to pound you out right away. He will give you multiple chances because God is a God who forgives and loves you. Likewise, we are supposed to be doing the same to our fellow believers. Now, the second passage, Paul addresses a different situation. He's addressing the entire church and how they respond to when a believer is caught in sin. So how do they do that? Well, what does Paul call us to do? He calls us to restore the, per to restore the person gently. He tells us to carry the burdens with them, as long as it doesn't cause them to sin as well. He says you need to be careful because sometimes whenever you are so passionate about a friend or a family member who's in sin, sometimes Satan can come in and sometimes he can bring that same sin and that same temptation that person's struggling with in your life. For example, if you're going to, uh, if you're an alcoholic and you have the problem with continually being drunk, and as you continue to go through that problem, you stand by that person, it can be very tempting sometimes to drink. He says to do this with caution and with ease. And uh, to understand how to do that is more of a one-on-one -on -one situation between you and the Lord than it is necessarily by me telling you how to do it. Now, the next thing I want you to talk about is again that the goal is never, never to scold the person. The person is, the goal is to bring them back into a relationship, not drive them away. You want to bring them back into the church in a proper relationship with God. You want to love them, all right? Now, I also want to address, too, this situation right here is not how we deal with people who are not believers. If they're not a follower of Christ, this is not how we address the situation. If we address the situation like this with non-followers of Christ, it will just push them farther and farther away from Christianity. And instead of trying to bring them in and see, let them see God's love, instead what we're doing is we're pushing them away and we're no longer um, witnessing to them. We've put more harm in their hearts towards Jesus instead of love and compassion towards them. You gotta remember that a non-believer is already someone who doesn't wanna follow after Christ. There's already somebody who struggles with sin daily. And so scolding them about their sin isn't going to solve anything because we have to bring them to Jesus first and we have to let God work in their lives first and uh, it's not our job to condemn them. Now, what 
I do want to say is these patches, passages do give us a picture of Christians who, um, who do bring this confrontation into the light. Um, but the problem is, is that if we don't do this, we do not grow. And as you're continuing to do things at home and you're quarantined, there may be some there may be some difficult situations that you have to go to where you have to confront things uh, within your family, within uh, your friends that you're texting with or that you're communicating with on social media. Um, the only thing that you have to do is you have to have the guts to say, "There's an elephant in the room, and this problem needs to be solved." And you need to go about it biblically in love and truth and follow how God wants you to do it. Now, as we wrap up this session, I have five questions that I would like you for, to answer as a family. One is being, what are the burdens that you're supposed to be carrying? Paul instructs us to carry each other's burdens. What does that mean? Question number two is this. What does binding and loosening things on earth and heaven have to do with dealing with people that have wronged us? It's a big question. Question number three. Which model of confrontation are you most comfortable with? Jesus's or Paul's? Paul's is Galatians. Jesus's method is definitely in, uh, is in Matthew. Question number four. What would, you, uh, keep, what would keep you from confronting someone who has sinned against you? And question number five. How do we reconcile these passages with Jesus's call for us to turn the other cheek? How is that different from Jesus telling us to turn the other cheek? What, what's different between that passage and this passage? Go ahead and take some time to talk about that with your families. I'm praying that you guys have a great week. If you have any questions, please feel to contact me through Facebook, through Instagram, calling up the church, find people to contact me with. But let's go ahead and pray, and uh, I, will, I will talk to you soon, and I uh, hope God's working great in your lives. Dear Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you for this time. I'd like to pray that you create, create an environment within the youth group, Dear Heavenly Father, within this church that allows us to be able to talk to each other openly without being able to get offended, without being um, so hot-headed, dear Father, but that you allow us uh, to go at it with an open heart and with open ears, and that you prepare the hearts of those that need that to happen. I ask these things in your name. Amen.